Okay, I'm going to call the uh, Dublin City Council meeting of April the 23rd back into session. I have four of my friends up here with me. So I'm not sure what competition Audrey won, but she won a competition in this poor child. Her award was having lunch with me. So, uh, so I went up to Glacier Ridge, and I had lunch with my four friends here. It's Audrey and Camille. Which one are you? <laughs> that one. And Nina? That one. And Camden. So what they are going to do is they are going to, Audrey's going to be acting mayor for the next two minutes, and they are going to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. So please stand. Stand up, Audrey. Turn around. Do you know the Pledge of Allegiance? Yes. Okay. Go. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks, ladies. I'm afraid you got to go back there. Although, thank you. They did the uh, they did the quick version, and you know one of the probably the most enjoyable things about this position is going out into the schools and seeing the kids and. I can tell you we are in fantastic shape for the future because someone said there's the future mayor and that is what they are and they are a fantastic group and Doc Hoadley and the, the guys out at Glacier Ridge and the ladies and our entire school system is something we are extremely proud of. So thank you very much for coming in. Uh, moving on with our agenda. So the uh, and also in the category of special members of our community we have a, I don't know if everybody knows what the TED Talk series is, it's a series, is it on YouTube primarily? There's a lot of NPR, a lot of TED Talks, that they're, they're sort of short to the point informational, educational kind of sessions and we have four members of our community, four um, people, Sujit, come on up, he's one, Shane, Kai Tool, and Meili Kay. There we go, these four. Tell us what it is you guys are working on and uh, a little bit about yourselves and what you're doing. Um, yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Shane Osmus. I live at 4927 Long Benton Way. Um, Katul Patel, 8349 Adam Woodway. Sujit Ramesh Kumar, 7424 Maynooth Drive. Malika Vaspinar, 2945 Mallard Meadows. Thank you all for coming in. So who's going to be the spokesman, Shane? Uh, we'll be rotating out a little okay, bit. Okay, go. So, so I'll be starting us off today. Uh, so first of all, uh, good evening, members of council and city manager McDaniel. Uh, we're incredibly excited to be here to talk to you all about our TEDx event, TEDx Innovation Drive. Uh, so we've been working on this project for around the past eight months or so, and we were recently granted licensure back in February. So it took us around six months to get all the kinks worked out and to get approval from TED to officially run this project. Um, we were inspired by other local community TED events, such as TEDx New Albany and TEDx Columbus, that have had a pretty long-standing history of contributing and giving back to the community uh, through uh, engaging talks and speaker sessions. So my friend Sujit here is going to tell us a little bit about what TED and TEDx exactly means and what it can do for Dublin. Fantastic. Well, um, TEDx is a branch off of the... Uh, that you guys may be familiar with TED conferences. Uh, those happen twice a year in Vancouver um, and other places. But uh, TEDx, each city, university, business is allowed to host their own TEDx event. And we want to do that here in Dublin. And like Shane said, uh, some of our neighboring communities, such as New Albany, Worthington, Hilliard, all have, all have had their own TEDx event in the past. Um, and I feel like our city is just big enough and our community is uh, progressive enough to where we can host our own event to success and not only just host one event but have it as an annual thing. Um, so that's the importance of sustainability for this event. Um, and although it may seem like uh, it's student run, uh, we have had several um, adult hands um, in this project and we want to maintain that um, and get uh, make sure this is a community wide project um, over the next several years. 
Um, for the TEDx that we want to bring to Dublin, we have chosen to have our theme be challenging the status quo. We felt that this was a very appropriate title and like theme for our event because Dublin is an innovative city and we are always working to achieve like new things and to make Dublin like a better place even like better than it currently is and we feel that with challenging the status quo we are incorporating what Dublin stands for and broadening like our perspectives for it. Um, we also have uh, student speakers and adult speakers that are going to be represented at the event. Um, we're going to have a uh, speakers ranging from a comedian named Javier Sanchez who talks about motivation and uplifting and we're gonna have a student from uh, Kaufman speak about awareness uh, in areas such as mental health and self well-being. So the event date uh, that we have in mind is July 7th 2018. Um, we want to thank uh, the Ohio University Medical Center for providing us the venue. Um, the event will be start around 10 p.m. and around, end around uh, 3 p.m. with uh, food being served. There will be performances and there will be a total of seven talks, uh, three students and four adults. Um, we would love your guys' um, support on this project and, and we would love to see, uh, see you there. Um, Shane, you want to talk more about Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, our sponsor. Yeah, for sure. Um, so we've been incredibly fortunate to have some pretty significant community backing uh, through this program. Um, one of our biggest sponsors so far and our first grant uh, was through the Dublin Foundation. We received a, a $3,500 grant um, to continue this project into next year to provide sort of a startup fund uh, to allow us to continue this project and um, give it a little bit of sustainability. Uh, additionally, the city of Dublin itself has given us a lot of, a lot of help uh, just in organizing in general um, and, you know, helping us along the way. Uh, this has been a learning experience for all of us and uh, the help of the City of Dublin in procuring things such as uh, the OU Medical Center, um, food items, merchandise, etc., has been greatly appreciated. And it's something that we really just wanted to recognize here, especially with the help of Christine Nordecchia in the back, who's really helped us out a lot. So. We would also like to thank Dublin for the providing um, Dublin video and broadcasting for our event as well. <laughs> well, we would love to answer any questions you guys may have about our event. Sure. Uh, questions from Council? Is there a fee to attend the event? Um, uh, since this is our first uh, year event, with the first year license, we are limited to 100 guests. Okay. And with that license, we'd like to make it an invitation list for our live audience, but luckily uh, with TEDx events you save all the videos and broadcasts and those get uploaded to YouTube. Um, and we also plan on live streaming the event with the help of Dublin. Um, so this year, uh, no, it's not going to be, the tickets aren't going to cost money, but we hope um, in future years as our event gets bigger and bigger, um, we can start charging for tickets and that would help us fund future events and it's just like a snowball. Okay, thank you. You know, you all are incredibly polished and articulate. You may not know that, but you uh, come across extremely well. I mean, it's very, it's unusual uh, to see that kind of polish at your ages. Maybe they should do a TEDx. Yeah. yeah. I think they're going to be, uh, they're going to be running for some seats up here very soon, right. I think. So. You guys could be your own speakers. <laughs> so it's, it's incredibly hard to get picked for want to speak at one of these. How did you guys decide on who's going to be on, on your um, speaker list? Um, so a while back we had um, kind of like tryouts where students can come. Uh, this, is, this was just for the students. Since there were more students that wanted to help speak and um, perform at the event, we're going to be having uh, tryouts for performances, but we had um, a kind of like an audition for uh, speakers to speak, and we chose three yeah. uh, student speakers for our event in that way. And for adult speakers, we contacted them through connections that we have. So how many are there total? Three students and how many other speakers? Yeah, there's a total of seven speakers. Um, we have three students. Um, there's uh, two students from Kaufman and one student <coughs> from Scioto. Um, and then we have uh, the rest are adults. Um, we have people who are innovators in the form of like starting their own companies and then we have uh, folks like like Josh Josh Cope. Mm -hmm. um, he's he, he's the uh, CEO of Ecochem Fuels um, and he's going to talk uh, give his talk about uh, 
how innovation and integration can come together to make more impact um, and stuff like that. And how did you select your topic of um, challenging the status quo? Uh, challenging the status quo, uh, when you apply for the license, they ask you to pick a, uh, pick a topic. And I just felt like um, in today's society, we'd, we, if we think outside the box and, and really challenge what the general like, notion of things to do, if we do that, then we can innovate and move forward. Stuff like that. So it's a, it, every year, the, ch the theme will change. Um, so this year, it's to challenge the status quo. I have to brag on them for just a minute because uh, they came before the Dublin Community Foundation to get their $3,500 grant, and uh, that was money that, uh, from what I heard the people around the table saying, was very easy to give to you because they were really excited about the things that you were doing, the passion that you came forth and doing it, um, and really the promise of uh, just being outstanding members of a, of a progressive thinking city. So. You guys have done a great job, and that money will serve you well. What they didn't tell us today is that they can't take any uh, money from a government governmental entity. Um, that That's one of the rules, right? So we, we could do in-kind services for the video sort of thing. Um, and so that, that put a huge burden on them to go elsewhere to find financial resources, and they've done a great job and um, have been able to come up with what they need. Well, I want to compliment the four of you because I'm a TED junkie. I absolutely love the TED conferences. And you will reach global audiences because I watch TEDx as well. So I think what you're doing is fabulous for the city. I think you all should be very proud of yourselves. I think it's amazing that you started this on your own. And as a council and as a city, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Good luck. And we'll do whatever we can to help you. Yes, we appreciate the support. Mm -hmm. and we just see so much potential in our residents that we can, we, we feel like every year we have great talks and just great ideas worth spreading, which is like the main motto of TED. So that's why we feel like Dublin's the perfect city for a TED talk. Yeah, and, and Mike's right. You as four high school students, most adults would not want to stand up and do what it is that you're doing or do it nearly as well. So congratulations that, for that. So again, it is July the 7th. I don't, my phone disappeared somewhere. It's got my calendar on it. What day of the week is that? Is that a Saturday? It's a Saturday. Okay, so July the 7th, Saturday, July 7th out at OU's campus, Yeah. I'm assuming. Yes. And if someone wants to try to get on that invitation list, that 100 golden tickets, how do they try to get those? Well, um, for if you want to reserve a spot on that 100 uh, person guest list, um, we, we only have a certain amount of uh, seats we could probably give away because we do have a lot of invitations that need to be sent out and um, stuff like that. Yeah, including everyone here who will be receiving an invitation <laughs> for the event, obviously. And then um, basically they just have to email us at TEDxInnovationDrive at gmail.com. Okay, um, so TEDxInnovationDrive at gmail.com. Is there going to be something on the city's website, do you figure, Dana, Christine? Susan, Sue, somebody. Okay, so yeah, there you go. <laughs> doing everything I can up here. Um, well, that's fantastic, and that and it and it sort of dovetails very nicely to the next item on our agenda, which is the fact that it is going to be National Volunteer Work Volunteer Week here in Dublin, and we're going to take the opportunity to use you for as an example of what it is that volunteerism means in Dublin, and I'm going to give you this proclamation, and it says. Whereas the City of Dublin supports and cultivates volunteer involvement to strengthen citizen engagement, enhance city services, and promote city learning. And whereas thousands of our residents, corporate partners, and surrounding community members step forward to volunteer, thereby extending the City of Dublin's scope of services and enriching the fabric of local government. And whereas volunteers across the nation as well as, as in the City of Dublin are recognized at this time of the year in ceremonies, public awareness campaigns, and personal expressions of gratitude. And whereas the City of, that the City of Dublin City Council recognizes and values the importance of volunteers, students, leaders, and social entrepreneurs, as well as the staff who work with them on a year-round basis. And whereas the City of Dublin volunteers of all ages, abilities, backgrounds, and affiliations have served valuable service hours to our boards, commissions, offices, parks, events, recreation courses, police programs, and community-led initiatives. And whereas volunteers truly reflect the power of reaching out to the people that they serve, as well as to be an inspiration to others. Now, therefore, I, Gregory S. Peterson, Mayor of the City of Dublin, Ohio, on behalf of all of Dublin City Council, 
do hereby proclaim the week of April 15th through the 21st, 2018 as National Volunteer Week in the City of Dublin, Ohio, and encourage all citizens to acknowledge the contributions made to the quality of life in our city through the spirit of engagement of, and engagement of our citizens through volunteerism signed this 23rd day of April 2018. So thank you very much for what you do for our community and I'd like to present this to you. Okay, so we went from middle school to high school. Our, our future is in good hands. Thank you for coming in. Uh, the next item on the agenda, Columbus Metropolitan Li Library. Patrick, welcome. Thank you. Mayor, members of council, it's a pleasure to be here tonight to give you an update, not only on our project, but our fundraising efforts. We're excited about that. I wanna start with a little bit of an outgrowth from our partnership that we've had and established. And that is, uh, we're in the process of implementing a new financial system, a new ERP at the library. It happens to be Tyler Muniz and uh, Angel Muma, the director of finance, has been a great resource to our team. And I think it's indicative of the partnership that we've developed. So just want to make sure that you're aware of your team helping us in other ways as well. So Angel, thank you very much. All right. Um, well, you know about the progress of the library just having driven by, and I was there last week as well, it is really coming out of the ground quickly. Um, showing this photo, we had over 400 who showed up for the wall breaking, and we know that the kids were the stars of that effort, but thanks to all of you for being there that day. We are at our temporary location at 6765 Dublin Center Drive, and um, I think for the most part we would pronounce that a success. Some of our customers say, well, that's a little bit modest for what we expect. And we say, well, we're really about trying to put the money moving forward, not for a temporary site, which will be just over, uh, what, about another 15 months or so before we are completed. Um, not only do I have this picture of Joe Yurcevich, but I brought Joe Yurcevich, uh, <laughs> who is our new branch manager in Dublin, and uh, he's got his hockey beard on tonight. I'm um, hoping for an extension. I don't want you to shave tomorrow, Joe. And uh, Joe has been with us over 20 years, most recently at the New Albany branch. He's done a great job there, and it did not take much convincing to get him over to Dublin because of the exciting project that we have here. So uh, an update as it relates to our fundraising. Our original budget for this project was at 18.3. We're currently at 21.1. That is our guaranteed maximum price. You see that our fundraising goal um, to date is, um, or was 2.8 million. And I'm um, pleased to tell you that uh, we've raised about $600,000 to date. Uh, it's hard to say that this is the quiet phase when you're addressing council and it's being on uh, broadcast, but um, we will say that our focus is still on the large gifts before we do take this campaign public. We uh, have created a branch fundraising committee co-chaired by Dr. Carol Clinton and Sid Romberg. You see the list of names of other residents who are helping us with this eff effort as well. There are also a number of others who said, really don't want to be listed as a committee member, but I'm excited to help you and, and be of counsel to us. And uh, we're very excited to have this group. Our next meeting with them will be on Wednesday. Um, we'll point out that uh, Michelle Kramer, uh, who is the Dublin Community Foundation president, is on this committee. And uh, much as we did uh, at our New Albany branch, back uh, in, in 2004, uh, they kick-started their community foundation with their signature project of the library. And so we see this as a real win-win effort to 
not only have, uh, we hope, a successful project for Dublin, but also to create some legacy uh, momentum for the Community Foundation. So just letting you know, uh, giving you a sense of uh, not necessarily the details, but all of our libraries have had uh, naming opportunities, and we are showing you some samples here, everything from naming particular areas all the way up, given the size of the gift, um, to naming of a building. That is of a building, never of the branch. So this is one of the floors in the new library, and this color code scheme actually corresponds to a donor recognition menu that we have. And uh, there will actually be um, one of these for each of the three floors. And so it's an opportunity as we engage members of the community, particularly businesses and civic clubs and individuals who want to show their support for the library. This is a way for us to share that recognition and that's been a, um, a great methodology for us in the past and we're confident that's going to be of interest to the Dublin residents at all. Um, with that, I want to make sure that uh, I do two things. I want to introduce uh, Nikki Scarpetti. Uh, Nikki, if you could stand for just a moment. Nikki is our interim development director. Kelly Stiefeld, who really helped put together the committee, is on maternity leave. She'll return in June. Uh, but Nikki has stepped in and is doing a great job. And then I think many of you know Allison Circle, who's our chief customer experience officer, who has really been the, uh, the lead from the library standpoint on all of our design efforts working with the architects. I think you have this one handout. And uh, do. I think it's important for me to just highlight one item, because it's really easy to get wrapped up in concrete and landscaping and building plans and forget what it's all about. It's really creating an envelope where we can provide the services that address the needs of your community. And I'd make a, a slight modification in the lower left-hand corner where it says 30% of the children not on track for reading at grade level. That's really kindergarten readiness. And if you talk to Dr. Hoadley, that indeed remains an issue. And by the way, that's not a school issue, right? These are incoming kindergartners who have not had those experiences. And so that's the average for the Dublin City Schools. We work with 10 school districts, so we look at that closely. And it's in all of our interests to really make sure we are addressing those needs and others that uh, are faced in, in really all of our locations. And so with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have for me this evening. Questions from council? Well, it's exciting Mike? to watch it go up. I can tell you that. Uh, for the amount of time and the years we put in okay. trying to get there, uh, appreciate everything you've done. Thank you. Well, appreciate your support and partnership on this effort. Does it seem as though things are timing-wise on schedule? They are. So right now we would be looking at a May 2019 uh, dedication so um, and I think um, well, I don't know that we've talked about this but I think we're looking at a kind of a, a shared um, opening of both the parking and the library at the same time is that still well, our thing? Yes I, I know we're working towards that end and having that under the umbrella of one general manager of the project I think right. gives us a great chance at crossing the finish line appropriately. Right. I, that's just amazing for what has to be built and it's only really, it really 12, 12 months away is and half of that's been bad weather. Really incredible. Right. Incredible. Well, we have the live cam that you can actually watch. So How do people get on that, Pat? Um, wow. On the city's website. Yeah. Very yep. cool. Kathy? I've had... Um, Residents, friends, neighbors what, tell me that they walk by once a week to see what the difference is. So there are people excited and, and, and watching. So yeah. that's great news. And then they'll tell me, oh, my goodness, this happened or that happened. So on the way to, you know, coffee or whatever, they're walking by to see how it's going. So. That's great. So that's then great. we want to train them to use our coffee shop once we open. <laughs> <laughs> I think you had a, every excavator in the entire county there at one point. Uh, I, it was an unbelievable amount of equipment over there when they started. The I agree. I agree. We were stunned to see it. So, Did you I, find anything buried? Uh, it's in the middle of uh, probably land that's been 
inhabited for years and years. Did the excavators come up with anything interesting? Uh, I have not heard, heard? of anything. Yeah. Okay. Just curious. Date. Since the old school was there, I just thought maybe you'd run into something. Yeah. If you were. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, thanks a lot for coming in, Pat. We really appreciate the Great. update. We appreciate the partnership. And Great. Thank moving you. Moving into the future. Thanks a lot. Okay, I don't think anybody, did anybody, we've gotten to the citizen comments portion of the agenda. I don't have anybody that had signed in, but is anybody here that would like to make a comment about anything that's not on the agenda? There's nobody left. We got staff, we got staff and us. Anything we want to talk about? This, this is how exciting we are. <laughs> All right, Eric and Chief, well, they never, have. All right, we will just move along to the consent agenda. Does anyone on council want to remove any of the four items that are on the consent agenda? Then I make a motion that we approve those four items. Is there a second? Uh, second. <clears throat> Ann? Uh, Mr. Keenan? Yes. Mr. Weiner? Yes. Mr. Rosa? Yes. Mr. Ludo? Yes. Mayor Peterson? Yes. Ms. Fox? Yes. Vice Mayor Ambrose Grooms? <coughs> second reading of ordinance 28-18, Ann? Amending the annual appropriations for the fiscal year ending December 31, 2018. David, welcome. Anybody have any questions for David? Anything changed? No, nothing changed. No nope. questions? <laughs> Ann? Vice Mayor Ambrose Grooms? Yes. Mr. Keenan? Yes. Mr. Reiner? Yes. Ms. Fox? Yes. Mr. Rosa? Yes. Mayor Peterson? Yes. Mr. Ludo? Yes. David, you did a fine job. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming up there. I appreciate it. <laughs> Fred had been standing out in the lobby when he did that. Uh, I would like to consider the next three ordinances, which are all in relation to the Highland Croy Road Riviera Connector. I move to waive the rules of order and discuss these ordinances 2930 and 31-18 together. Is there a second? A second. <clears throat> Mr. Keenan? Yes. Vice Mayor Morris Grooms? Yes. Mr. Reiner? Yes. Mayor Peterson? Yes. Ms. Fox? Yes. Ms. Aludo? Yes. Mr. Rosa? Yes. And these uh, 2918 uh, involve Sabra L. Minyard and William Minyard located at 8698 Highland Croy Road. 30 involves <clears throat> Riviera Ventures LLC. Uh, this is property located east of Highland Croy Road along the proposed Cachio Lane. And 3118 is Elaine, E. Elaine T. Hoare, trustee of uh, this revocable trust, executed March 12, 2009, located at 8668 Highland Croy Road. Dana, anything different? No change from Any questions from council? Okay, vote on all three ordinances, Ann. There's just a second. I'm sorry. Yes. I'm sorry. I said no change from it. Yeah, no, we're good. Uh, Mr. Rosa? Yes. Mr. Reiner? Yes. Ms. Ludo? Yes. Ms. Fox? Yes. Mayor Peterson? Yes. Vice Mayor Grooms? Yes. And Mr. Keenan? Yes. Uh, first readings, I make a motion that uh, the next four ordinances, as they're all related to Highland Croy Riviera Connector, I make a motion that we <clears throat> engage discussion on all four of those ordinances, 32, 33, 34, and 35, 18 together. Is there a second on that motion? I'll uh, second it. Ms. Fox? Mr. Bosa? Yes. Mr. Reiner? Yes. Mr. Keenan? Yes. Ms. Aludo? Yes. Mayor Peterson? Yes. Vice Mayor Ambrose Grooms? Yes. Uh, these three properties, uh, Ordinance 3218 is Darshan Shaw at 8700 Highland Croy Road. 3318 is Noman Malik and Josephine Samina Malik, 8640 Highland Croy Road. 3418 is Barbara Strobel and Lanny Strobel, uh, 8622 Highland Croy Road. And 3518 is Kevin D. Mullins and Jocelyn Mullins. 8600 Highland Croy Road. Uh, thank you, uh, members of council. This, uh, the introduction of these ordinances has to do with the same project, obviously, that you just passed. Um, and as a first reading, um, uh, this is uh, the purpose of these ordinances are to um, uh, set the conditions for staff to go forward with a uh, negotiation with these property owners. Um, we hope that an amicable resolution can be reached with them. Um, this would also enable the, the city's law director's office to file complaints for appropriation in the event that those negotiations are unsuccess unsuccessful. The ordinance is also authorized the city to enter into the reasonable administrative settlement in the best interest of the city without further legislation. And staff recommends adoption of these ordinances at the second <coughs> reading public hearing on May 7th. I'll introduce those. Um, any comment from or questions from council? <coughs> I do have some questions and you know I'm struggling through this digital process so my question may be a, a minute late but so as we're looking at the at the drawing of where the new roadway is going to pass through so this 8600 8622 70 70 89 
those flag-shaped lots. <coughs> um, the parcels that we're talking about relative to Ordinance 80 or uh, 3218 is the 8700. Let's see. Let me just line these up in my mind here. Um, 8460. And 8622. Um, would these have new drive cuts onto this roadway? And has that been communicated to? Can you tell me a little bit about how we've how we've navigated this process? Because uh, you know it it appears that most of this easement is a removal of the access to Highland Croy and placing it on this Cacio Lane. Correct and. There's been individual contact with each resident by Mike Sweeter, who was the project engineer, project manager uh, for this particular project. So he's explained that to each of the residents that will lose their long driveway um, onto Highland Croy, that they will have an individual access point on the north side of Cascio Lane. And Cascio Lane, from uh, I haven't seen construction drawings on it yet, but the, the text indicates that it's going to be uh, like a boulevarded roadway. Correct. So are they, do they have full access point entry and exit is it right turn only it's full access full okay so there'll be cuts in the in the median strip Correct. to provide for them yeah because they're rather large <coughs> lots sure yeah um okay um and that really is just the three properties that you see uh starting with the green middle and then going to the right the purple and then the darker purple so. that's really a win for all those people isn't it i mean not having to maintain a long driveway and such we would think it is, but I'm not sure that they would share that opinion. <laughs> well, they've been they've been back in a relatively right. secluded area. Right. Now they're going to be adjacent to a road, so. So for them, it's a change. Yeah, yeah. There, I could see how you, there mm -hmm. could be uh, alternate ways to think of that. Okay, I just wanted to to make sure because uh, it it appeared that they were that the access to Highland Croy was going to be rerouted. Any other questions from council? Is that it, Chris? That's all I had. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, we'll see you back on those Thank issues you. on May the 7th. Ordinance 36-18. Authorizing the city manager to, <coughs> to execute and accept necessary conveyance documents and contracts to acquire a 0.230 acre fee simple and warranty deed for right of way without limitation of existing access rights from Harry D. Miller, a.k.a. Harry David Miller and Anna Louise Miller, located at 6260 Rings Road for the public purpose of constructing a new roadway, which shall be open to the public without charge. I'll introduce it. Dana? Yes, uh, this project has to do with the construction of a total crossing boulevard extension, and which will also include Avery Road improvements, as well as uh, improvements along Wilcox Road and um, Rings Road and Cara, Cara Road and Cara Court. Uh, there is a map included in your staff report. Um, also, you might recall this is in our capital improvement uh, budget. However, it is pending funding, uh, ongoing funding from regional sources. Uh, the project requires the acquisition of property interests from multiple property owners on Tuttle Crossing Boulevard, Avery Road, Wilcox Road, Rings Road, Kara Road, and Kara Court, as I mentioned. Um, so at this time, uh, the parties have come to mutual uh, agreeable terms for the acquisition of the property interest from Harry D. Miller and um, Anna Louise Miller for $9,880, which was the appraised value. Uh, the ordinance authorizes the city manager to execute all the necessary conveyance documents and contracts to formally acquire the necessary property interest uh, from the property owner. Staff recommends approval at the uh, second reading public hearing. Any questions from council? All right, we'll see you back on May 7th on that one as well. Resolutions. Resolution 19-18. Declaring certain city-owned property a surplus, authorizing the city manager to dispose of said property in accordance with Section 37.07 of the Dublin Codified Ordinances. I'll introduce it, Dana. Uh, this uh, has to do with Section 3707 of the Dublin Codified Ordinances, requires city council authorization for disposal of property over the value of $5,000. Uh, this resolution authorizes the city manager to dispose of certain vehicles and equipment that are already planned for replacement as part of the 2018 capital uh, improvement program. Um, there is a list of the equipment and vehicles uh, provided to you in the staff report. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Also, uh, Director Daryl Seiler is here as well. If you have any questions about Questions that. from Council? 
Upon approval, how fast does that go out, Dana? When does that hit I'm sorry, street? sir, what was that again? Upon approval tonight, how fast does that go out? I'm not sure the exact date. I think it's, uh, you're, about, you're ready to go right away, aren't you, Daryl? They would, they would go out no later than Wednesday. Really? To GovDeals. That would be on GovDeals.com? Correct. Okay. Yeah, I would mention, I, I failed to, to mention that uh, these will be advertised on GovDeals.com, so if the public's interested in uh, the disposal of this property, they can access it through what's called GovDeals. Dan, I have a question for you. I was just kind of curious. I noticed, um, I know some of the vehicles um, are older with low mileage, and um, also, I'm just just out of information, um, like the um, the Hustler Super Zs. Those, we usually get average hours out of something like that. I mean, how do, how do you determine? Like, it doesn't seem like it's that many hours of use. Right. But I'm just kind of curious. Yeah. Well, it's a huge variety. So that you know, they go from 282 hours all the way up to 943. Right. <laughs> you know, not that I'm questioning. I'm just kind of curious how one just. Decides. It seems like these don't have a lot of hours, but yeah, Daryl, you want to speak to how you Absolutely. analyze it? Absolutely. This, this, all of our hustler mowers typically have a two-year factory warranty, mm -hmm. so we rotate them out every two years. Um, what that does is allow us uh, the maximum return when we do put them out to auction. Typically, these are in high-use, high-dusty areas of the city. They get used five, six, seven days a week. Um, they may have low hours on one side of the area because they just mow a particular ball field or they may be used across town. But where we see our return on investment is the uh, not having to worry about the uh, maintenance during the warranty phase. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions from council? Ann? Uh, Mr. Reiner? Yes. Mr. Rosa? Yes. Ms. Fox? Yes. Mayor Peterson? Yes. Ms. Aluto? Yes. Vice Mayor Amaros Grooms? Yes. And Mr. Keenan? Yes. Resolution 20-18, Ann. Accepting the lowest and best bid for the 2018 Shared Use Path Maintenance Program. I'll introduce it, Dana. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, three bids were received, publicly opened in red for the 2018 Shared Use uh, Path Maintenance Program. The engineer's estimate was $315,000. The budgeted funds for two, 2018 uh, Shared Use Path Maintenance Program and the Capital Improvement Program are $450,000. The bid came in at $266,000. $661.31. The uh, successful bidder is uh, Decker Construction. Uh, staff recommends approval of this resolution. And we ha do have experience with this um, company, and it has been positive. Questions from council? Hearing none. Ann? Um, Mr. Keenan? Yes. Vice Mayor Amaros Grooms? Yes. Mr. Saluto? Yes. Mayor Peterson? Yes. Ms. Fox? Yes. Mr. Rosa? Yes. And Mr. Reiner? Yes. Resolution 21-18. Accepting the lowest and best bid for the Emerald Parkway Bridge Deck Overlay. I'll introduce it. Dana? Uh, again, three bids were received. Public open and read for the Emerald Parkway Bridge Deck Overlay Project. The engineer estimate was is uh, $1,520,000. This is a preventative maintenance project to remove and replace the concrete deck on the Emerald Parkway Bridge over the Scioto River. And a copy of the construction drawings were placed in the council uh, um, meeting room if you wanted to review those. The majority of the work is going to be accomplished using a technique called hydro demolition. Don't ask me about that. I'll bring up Megan and she can explain that to you. But it's a, it's a unique uh, technique and one that's highly efficient, we believe, and certainly will help this project to go much quicker. Uh, we describe in the uh, staff report how we will uh, maintain traffic for the most part, two-way traffic. There will be some temporary closure on weekends um, to allow for some of the, uh, the work to be done. Also included in your packet is information about the messaging and communication strategy involved in this so that we are sure to get the word out to our residents regarding this project. Questions from council? Uh, I have a couple questions. Um, in the, um, you know, the successful bidder came nearly 36% under estimate, uh, and it talks about um, the pre-qualification pre of the contractor and their subcontractors. Do we have any idea how much of this work is subcontracted out versus, uh, you know, it seems to be a fairly uniform body of work. Um, so I just wanted to. Oh, I don't know specifically. I know the hydro demolition itself is subcontracted out and also the striping. <coughs> uh, 
I, but I don't know what other components, but we can get that for you. I'd like to see it because that, that seems like it would be the lion's share of the work is the, uh, uh, that, um, that removal piece. Okay. Megan said Prime's doing just over 50% of the work. It's subcontracted. Mm -hmm. and, and we vetted uh, just 36% under our, you know, our estimate is a little bit alarming. And, you know, we're going with someone who we've not worked with before. But I understand you checked out um, with them their um, references, but how about their subcontractors? Yeah, we are very familiar with their subcontractors. That wasn't mentioned in the memo. Do you recall? Which I had that conversation with Barb. Do you remember? Yeah, Barb, Barb and I think also Bob Taylor. Okay. With the subcontractor. Yeah. So it was I, someone that we've done know business off the top with. of my hand, head, but we did look at the subcontractor. Yeah. And it's someone we that we we are familiar with in yes. the community. Yes. Okay. Yes. I, it just that that being that much under, uh, you'd kind of like to know the subcontractors because that's where really really where the rubber tends to meet the road. Um, the other thing that we look at is all of the bids were in the same vicinity of one another. So it's not like we had one anomaly that was 30 some percent under and the others were much higher. So the fact that they're all grouped together is a comforting thing. And also they believe the hydro demolition subcontractor was also um, part of at least one other prime contractor's bid. Oh, okay. So they had so, oh, quoted mm -hmm. from the same sub. Correct. Okay. Then I had one other question, not really uh, more of a comment. Uh, the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission, uh, they recently were talking about an update they did to their website uh, with respect to uh, traffic tools and upcoming uh, construction. And I think it might be worthwhile to, we have our key audiences here, but I think maybe we, because of the proximity to the zoo and it's going to be happening during the summertime, I think we might want to reach out to those folks too so that they can publicize those things so we can... Uh, just get the message out to a little broader audience because people might be coming into our community to visit the zoo or other attractions at that same time. So if if you, I think Absolutely. you've got that stuff you can get to. Yeah, that. I we believe that discussion was in the context of paving the way, and we do yeah. provide all of our project information to paving the way. They have a, a breakfast, I believe, every spring, and all of the communities in the region provide all their upcoming construction Great. information to them. Thank you. Hey, Megan, could you just explain to us why we're replacing that deck? I mean... Of course, we go over it every day, but is it just cracking up the substrate, or yeah, it's, over it's, time, is this something we do? It's a preventive measure to avoid a much more costly, full-blown deck replacement. So this is more of an overlay procedure. Is that because the concrete's failing over time, too much salt? What? Yeah, it's just wearing. So it removes the wearing course, and the hydro demolition process is effective in that it removes only the concrete or the deck that needs to be or something. Yep. Okay. Exactly. Just, just one other comment. The thing that surprises me about that bridge when staff brought this to me relative to the capital budget, I'm like, isn't that thing new? And they're like, no, it's 20 years old. 20 years. Yeah. It's, it's just yeah. time Great. flies, and yeah. I just never realized it was, I mean, I guess if I really thought about it, it's actually 20 years old, which just surprised me. You and I were standing out there for the dedication. <laughs> <laughs> I just didn't think it was that old. So. Yeah. And this is a really good time to perform this um, mm -hmm. operation to extend the life of the deck. Okay. I think cool. this, yeah, this relates back to the conversation we were having earlier in our, in our debt conversation that the more of this infrastructure, the maintenance cost of this over time is going to continue to to yep. grow for us. Mm -hmm. yep. It's a fact, so what, right? Yeah, what's the, uh, okay, so we do this and we strip off this, the top level, then what's the guarantee in the life of this? Then? Is it another 10 years, 20 years? This technique, I mean, I'm not familiar with this at all. Yeah, uh, between 10 and 20. Is there a warranty that comes with this work? Is there what? Pardon a warranty? Me? Yes. One year? <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> yes. Seriously? Okay. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> okay. It's better than a Any other questions? Warranty. All right. <laughs> We good? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Ms. Okay. Chris Dana. Oh, Ms. Saludo. Yes. Mr. Keenan. Mr. Rosa? Yes. Mayor Peterson? Yes. Ms. Fox? Yes. Mr. Reiner? Yes. Vice Mayor Ambrose Grooms? Yes. Resolution 22-18. Authorizing the city manager to enter into an agreement with Dublin City Schools for the provision of school resource officers for 2018-19. I'll introduce it. Dana? Sure. Uh, since 1998-99 school year, uh, the city and the Dublin School District have partnered to share a portion of the cost for providing full-time school resource officers to various schools in the Dublin City School System. Uh, the Dublin Community Education Unit um, has provided a full-time SROs for each middle school. There's four of those. In each high school, there's three of those. 
And in the current agreement with the schools, the city pays the full cost of two members of this unit. The schools and the city share equally in the cost for the remaining five members of the unit. I think uh, we can all agree this is a terrific program. Um, mm -hmm. There's been a lot of great experience and partnership built over the years since this has been in place. Um, the um, what's, what's referred to as General Order um, 44.2.4, uh, which is the Community Education Unit Program Manual that the police department uses. This is probably the best document that, that shows how that relationship has evolved over the years and the various responsibilities that have been um, uh, understood and eked out over time. So I think there's a very solid contract. Uh, staff would recommend uh, approval of this contract. Um, I guess for our, for our public's knowledge, the contract for the 17-18 um, school year included a reimbursement from the schools not to exceed $290,553.86. This one would include uh, reimbursement from the schools of $300,046.40. This, there's really no change or no significant change at all to the contract. It's just really reflective of the change in the cost of the officers. Uh, and the Lieutenant Pice, acting chief, is here. Uh, if you have any questions, you'd like to ask him more specifically. Uh, I have just one. Does this make an allocation for the new Emerald campus? Uh, this does not. This is a continuation of our current staffing for the school systems. We have not had that discussion yet with the school system on how we will, or, or the addition of anybody, we plan on using the existing staffing to address whatever the school's needs would be moving forward. Okay. Well, may, you know, I'm sure here soon they're planning on opening that up um, in the fall to some level of students. And I don't know what level, at what point we'll engage that, you know, formal policy, but might want to start those conversations. Well, the chief ready. mentioned to me before he left on vacation that um, there had been some suggestion of uh, some more partnering, but they had not gone deep on that yet. So I would imagine that's, that's, that's a good time. part of it. It's just such an important program. I mean, it just ha just the visual image when you drive, you know, you drive into Kaufman and there's a police cruiser sitting in front of the high school and Officer McLean's in there and you know, Brian's going to the plays and he knows the kids. The relationship that he has with the students is so incredibly important. Not to mention the security that they provide to the building. It's just, it's, it's a great partnership and it's such a fantastic thing that every single one of our schools has this kind of support. So. And they're all rock stars. Your officers that you've uh, seen are. there are they're, fantastic. They're, I mean, they're. Officer Collier at Jerome, I mean, he is like a small G god in there. He walks in the room and he's like, hey, Officer Collier's here. And it, they really do a fantastic job. Thank you very much. Yes, I think it's remarkable that there's a lot of conversations are occurring around the country about starting school resource programs. We've had this resource in place for, for 20 years now. I think it speaks to exactly how progressive Dublin has been in, in laying that foundation and partnership over time. So quick question. Will you have an opportunity to allow your newest officer, Finn, to visit the schools? Because I think the kids would think that was amazing. I, the, one of the things as we move the, uh, uh, the K-9 program back into um, our agency is, is figuring out exactly how to go back to some of the resources we utilized in the past for it and, and school um, contact is one of those pieces we'll certainly examine moving forward as the K-9 gets more comfortable. Yeah. Fantastic. Thanks, Lieutenant, for coming in. Mayor, if yeah. you don't mind, while sure. Lieutenant Pice is here, do, do you want to mention, uh, Justin, um, the introduction of um, Finn to the community and, and how that's going? I appreciate you raising that. I, Finn will be introduced to the community over time, right? And that we started that process, correct? Yeah, we have started to kind of roll out that introduction. We wanted to give uh, the the officer um, a little bit of time to get comfortable handling the dog and make sure that we did this um, in, in a manner that was, um, because we know there's going to be a lot of responsiveness from the community, um, but we wanted to make sure that we, we were conscious about giving him every opportunity to get comfortable with the dog before we put him uh, in a situation where um, we uh, were ready to, to introduce him to the public, but certainly that is coming, and, and we look forward to the opportunity to share that resource with the community. Fantastic. Thanks, Lieutenant. Thank you very much. Anything else on that, Dan? Any other questions from Council? Yeah. Mr. Reitner? Yes. Uh, Ms. Fox? Yes. Ms. Aluto? Yes. Vice Mary Morris Grooms? Yes. Mayor Peterson? Yes. Mr. Rosa? Yes. Mr. Keenan? Yes. Staff comments. Dana? I have nothing. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to Council Committee Reports, PNZ. Jane? Um, we had um, a workshop with ARB, Planning and Zoning Dead, and Don Elliott from um, Clarion and Associates gave give quite a long uh, talk about his review of the Bridge Street Code. Um, he said that the code was extremely burdensome, very cumbersome, um, that it had changed a lot since its original inception. A lot of things had been added to it. 
He didn't know how that came about, but that a lot of things have been added to it. He, um, he said that it made it very difficult for developers to get through and have any kind of predictability, that there were too many hoops to jump through, too many reviews to be done, and also um, just too many boxes to be checked. That what it did is instead of being flexible, it became rigid. Um, the recommendations, some of the recommendations included removing ART altogether, not to use ART, uh, to go back to an informal review, um, to give uh, developers an opportunity to bring in concepts instead of having to come in with their fully baked plans. The Bridge Street Code, and one of our complaints, at least one of mine in the past, has been that, that um, construction, uh, that these plans have come in fully baked and there's very little room to do anything with them because they've spent so much money. And uh, that was never the intent, apparently. So um, he suggested that we go back and uh, to a more of a concept so that developers can get an idea. And, and how that is done is yet to be figured out with future workshop sessions. Um, the, also, the other thing that he mentioned was we talked about the, um, that all the buildings are looking alike. Uh, some of that has to do with the fact that we have in Bridge Street one developer, so that is not something that organically can happen with one developer. You get a lot of different buildings. But with the Bridge Street code um, uh, revision, possibly, uh, one of the things he suggested was the um, using character guidelines that are the um, qualitative pieces of the code that we do not have at present time. And I asked whether or not that would be legally binding because guidelines are guidelines and zoning, is, um, zoning code is law. But he said they could be written so that they would be legally binding and that would help a lot. Um, so the, um, the other thing that was mentioned was um, in the report that was not really discussed that evening except among a couple members was uh, once again the removal of the historic district from the Bridge Street District. And a planning report, and I, I tried to pull it up, but I can't, I can't pull it off of here, but my understanding is planning has a group that's discussing this. And uh, I didn't get a chance to ask planning about that, but I'd like a follow-up on that. I'd like to know if there is a group that's discussing this and who that group is, and, and I'd like to know a little bit more about that. So uh, that was just in the planning report. It didn't get discussed that night. So that um, we're moving forward with... Um, uh, talking about these things, although I can't say that there was any concrete movement about exactly what the revisions are. It was just mainly that discussion, but those points I thought was important to tell you about. So we'll be having the next meeting here shortly. Another works out. Thank you, Jane. Uh, Admin Committee, Chris. A uh, couple things for the Admin Committee. Um, so we have a few workshops on our schedule at present, and uh, the first, ne the next one being on May the 14th. I'm sorry. Yeah, it'll be in the May 7th packet. Uh, the, but the workshop will be held on May the 14th. Um, at that time, uh, you'll get a packet on the 7th, and um, what we're going to be talking about there is some identification of policy issues, and so. That's going to be a really important um, work session for us to have. We're going to try to finish this, these conversations around uh, policy, particularly as it pertains to our retreat prior to our July break. And so um, I'm going to be emailing Anne tomorrow, and she's going to be looking for uh, an additional date on your calendar for an additional workshop so that we can wrap up that portion pr prior to our July break because we've got a really full docket um, before we hit the balance of the year with the uh, budgeting and all of those sorts of things. So um, please look for that, and I appreciate ahead of time your flexibility to add another night to your already very busy schedule. Um, the second thing that we'll see, um, we have come to, we, we've wrestled quite a bit with um, review material, and I think we've come to terms with what it is that we're going to do with reviews, and um, Anne will be circulating dates for the review schedule tomorrow as well. So those will be two additional nights that we're going to try to get in before um, before the, the July break and uh, get those projects wrapped up. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Community development. John? Yes, Chris, Kathy, and I will uh, probably set up a meeting here when the um, staff concludes the last the applications and their final submittals. So we really don't have a date yet, but we will for the historic district. Thank you. 
Finance. Mike? Well, I'd like to thank uh, Angel and her staff again for an excellent presentation and, and overview of city's debt policy. I uh, really appreciate all. I know it was a lot of effort, uh, a lot of extra work. Um, I think we had a robust exchange of questions and answers and, uh, you know, it was very helpful and productive for everybody, I, I think. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, I think it's something we can utilize in the future to, to refresh our memories because there's a lot of detail. You know, Angel has such a good grasp of it, it's hard to, you know, hard to imagine uh, um, really being that prepared. <laughs> that said, staff still owes us some additional information based on that, that meeting, which they're going to get back to us. Um, but I know they're also looking for council's affirmation of the current policy. I would recommend that we give that affirmation based on what we heard here tonight, the, uh, the information we heard from our uh, counselors, uh, our finance folks, uh, the independent consultants. And um, unless anybody has an objection, um, that would be my recommendation. Anybody? I have a question. Does that, um, that policy become part of the formal acceptance of the annual operating plan or copper is that done as a separate well the, the budgets are all itself. tied out to the debt policy really the CIP and the and, the, and our whole debt policy I mean they all interact together most especially the CIP right there are separate actions to approve the operating budget and capital exactly. budget but going into particularly the capital budget we would want to know what our constraints are with respect to debt which is why we would look to the debt policy. So having that as we lead into capital is very helpful. And that, and that doesn't tie anybody's hands for any, any action in the future. We can make any changes that we want, but I, I, I think it's very evident that what we do is far and above and beyond what uh, most uh, public entities do. And I mean, frankly, it's impressive uh, uh, the position that we have in, in terms of uh, where we stand financially. And thanks to everyone. I, I would like to add one thing. Uh, um, Councilmember Keenan, if I could, I, I think one of the future um, finance committee meetings may also be a discussion about revenue, revenue projections before we get into estimating capital. And that's one of the workshops I so mentioned to you earlier. Be one of the finance committee uh, um, topics. We also have a uh, in, in June. There, uh, uh, our investment, uh, one of our investment advisors is going to come in and go over um, some of our, our investment uh, strategies. And it's always quite interesting. He wants to talk about the uh, inverted yield curve and this and that and the other. And I told him my test is how much do we start with and how much do we have, yeah. okay, instead of the inverted yield curve. So and I guess while we're at it, one other topic would be bed tax policy discussion as well. So um, I, I think. Which lends itself to Chris's comments, too, about policies and, and so forth. So, Mr. Keenan, um, did you want us to have a motion to that effect, too? I think it would probably be a good idea. I'll make the motion that we affirm uh, the debt policy as was outlined today. And um, I would ask that you tie out this presentation to that, um, to that motion. Okay. And I'll second. Go. Yeah. Uh, Mayor Peterson. Yes. Vice Mayor Amaros Grooms. Yes. Mr. Reiner. Yes. Mr. Rosa. Yes. Mr. Keenan. Yes. Uh, Ms. Saludo. Yes. And Ms. Fox. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I think that's that's all I have. Thanks, Mike. Public Services Committee. Christina. Uh, we are have not met yet. We're scheduled to meet on the thirtieth. Central Iowa Transit Authority. Coda. Kathy. First meeting will be Wednesday. For okay. Me. Let us know how that goes. Thank that you. Goes. Looking uh, forward to it. Dublin Community Foundation. Chris. Well, you saw one of the recipients this evening of this grant cycle, um, the TEDx Innovation Drive folks. Uh, there were uh, a few others that were granted and some that weren't. Um, I'm not sure that they've notified all those people yet, so I won't go too, for, too far down that rabbit hole. Um, but, you know, they're meeting and they're raising money and, and they're really giving it a good faith effort. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Dublin Friendship Association, Christina. Uh, Nancy and I met with Tim Sword and Samin Dodfar of the Columbus Sister Cities International. Uh, we've begun to talk about some ways that we can collaborate with them on both some small events and uh, potentially a trip. They're very interested in uh, working with us potentially on an India trip um, in 2019. And uh, so we'll continue to work with them and I'll bring more back to you as those develop. Thank you. Uh, Morpsy, Chris. Uh, yes, had a couple thing from, uh, things from Morpsy. So uh, we had our, our meeting last week, and so we, we were successful in getting a seat on the executive committee, so we will have a voice at the table of those conversations that are coming up, and 
Uh, as you, many, uh, some of you went, I know Jane and I went to the State of the Region Morpsey luncheon, and it certainly was very informative to uh, things that are going on. They're, they're offering some, um, uh, through the Columbus 2020 organization, they're offering electric vehicle test drives. Um, Dane and I, I think, are going to look into how we might incorporate some of those in Dublin. It's kind of a neat thing. They bring in a bunch of different kind of electric vehicles, and they allow people to um, test drive them. They have, it's not a sales tool. They don't take any information. There's no salesperson there, but um, they'll give the opportunity and really talk about the environmental impact of those cars. So um, hopefully we'll be able to find a date for them to do that in Dublin. That's all I have. Thank you, Chris. Logan Union, Champaign County Regional Planning Commission, CAF. I have nothing to report. Then. About the US 33 Innovation Corridor Group, Kathy All and right. Jane. Um, so Jane and I uh, attended along with several members of the staff to the meeting last Friday. And I have to tell you, it was a fantastic meeting. We had the opportunity to hear from Matt Smith, who is um, a recently hired project manager from Michael Baker International, who gave an overview of the 33 Smart Corridor and, and really what it means to Dublin and to all of the partners up and down the corridor. I've seen a few different presentations, and I have to say this one was incredibly well done. Um, and he took the many activities that are sort of part of the grant agreement and began to put some shape around them. So. It seems that we're moving from planning a little bit more to the action. So it was a uh, it was a very good presentation, and I'm looking to Dana. I think at some point here in the future, I think it would be fantastic to bring him here, because um, back to electric cars, what's happening up that corridor is really unique, certainly in in, in um, central or Midwest, probably across the country, and I and I think he just did a terrific job in explaining that. Um, following that, the, the group then had an opportunity to talk about what this means for development up and down that corridor and many of our shared interests. So it was actually, a, it was a very good discussion. Um, and it's wonderful to see it moving from the planning into what would call the projects and the action phase. So we'll look to staff at, at some point when it makes sense to bring that because I think you would all benefit from hearing that discussion. Great. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, Arts Council, John. Yes, the uh, big fundraiser is uh, May the 4th from 6.30 to 9.30. <laughs> of course, I expect all of you to be there. And um, it is an elegant and lovely night. And um, there's 17 different food suppliers. And uh, the, the uh, Arts Council is working on their uh, kitchen to meet the, uh, stand, the uh, uh, county health standards. So they'll sh probably have some new opportunities for fundraising which would be great. So they're in progress. I've seen the work going on down there. Thank you. May 4th, 630. Be there. May Gotta 4th. be there. All right. Gotta support them. They need That's your help. The garden party, right? Yeah, it's a lovely right. evening. It really is. Board of Education, Christina. Um, we talked with uh, Dr. Hoadley. We got an update on the Emerald Campus um, and sort of some of the projected student growth update. We discussed the school's master planning process um, as relates to future schools and things of that nature. Um, and then I can bring the SRO question at our, to our next meeting um, and get you an update on their thoughts then. So thank you for bringing it up. And Washington Township. Chief, you got anything? Eric? I had an opportunity to, uh, Eric and I go way back, we had an opportunity to catch up last week at the DACA lunch, which I'll comment on here in a minute. And I got to tell you, Chief, you let the Washington Township commissioners know they are very lucky to have Eric in that role. He is up to speed and extremely bright, and he is uh, he is learning the history of that operation, and we're going to have great things that we can work on together. So, Eric, I look forward to that. Thank you. Uh, Roundtable. Jane? Um, um, just wanted to let you know that um, I've joined this steering committee as the next officio member of the Dublin Bridges. And uh, the Dublin Bridges Foundation has done such an amazing job so far in the short time they've been uh, here in Dublin. The, um, the foundation, or the, the Bridges, has uh, produced over $25,000 in one quarter of wow. gift giving. They anticipate that at the end of 2018 they will be giving over $100,000 worth of, worth of charitable donations. 
And the amazing thing about the Dublin Bridges uh, is that whenever a need comes up, it, you have to race to hit the donate button or you get left out. So um, I'll be bringing you more information about that wonderful, fabulous group. So I'm really pleased to say that I'm, I'm uh, participating in that. You know, and if um, I could just piggyback on that real quick, sure. Jane. Thanks to Dana and Matt and the, they made arrangements so that bridges can use the rec center to drop off. That's right. Hours for, and things. And right. Just, um, just, we're all rowing in the same direction on this. Yeah, that's, that's really, really, I forgot to mention that because they, you can drop off on the weekends and certain hours in the evening gift cards or donations or whatever. And Washington Township also has a room for, yeah. for small items that you're offering. And um, the, um, the generosity of this, of this city and this uh, group is just amazing. It just, we hear so many bad things that's happening in the world, but when you hear the good things uh, that are happening by people quietly, anonymously <coughs> giving a little bit here and there to people that are in need is just Amazing. Dublin Bridges actually, since uh, this last year, they're going to be uh, up to almost a million dollars in, in donations uh, since their inception. And it's in many other communities in uh, the Central Ohio area. I've been getting an awful lot of comments about the properties at the end of Monterey, which I know that you know, um, quite a few. And I know that you're working on that, uh, Dana. And one of the things I would ask is, can we take a look at our property maintenance ordinances and see if, if they're not strong enough? Uh, we have properties that are sitting abandoned, especially in the, in the core. They were for a while. And we didn't seem to have any strength about doing anything about it. So I would ask, um, ask to have a little follow-up on our, our property maintenance ordinance and see if we can't strengthen that a little bit. Because I, I probably get two or three calls a month on that. Um, uh, uh, I would also like to follow up with Council on our continued discussion about historic district dense policy. Um, a lot of people are calling about a lot of things that are going through the Architectural Review Board. And um, what I found today in, in going into the clerk's office is that our Architectural Review Board minutes are not being posted on the website. There's nothing since January. And I can't follow it up unless I go to the meetings and I can't always get to them. And some of the residents who are inquiring also can't seem to find out what's going on at the Architectural Review Board meeting. So I would like to, they're not, they're not, we kind of check, can't check find them. I'll check that and see what. Yeah, we'd like a turnaround after, uh, at least from the last meeting so that you know what's going on. Sure. So when you go to the next meeting, you kind of know what's happening. Okay, thanks Resident for making comments. me aware of that. I was not Sure, aware. no problem. And um, I'm just kind of curious about what's wrong with the Dublin Road bike path. It's been closed for quite a while. Um, I don't know. I think that utility work down there, Paul, can you, yeah, can you expound on that a little bit? Yeah, yeah the city of Columbus has set up down there um, making improvements to one of their shafts for okay. the interceptor sewer itself. Okay. So there just wasn't any other place for them to set. And yeah, they have been there a while, so we'll try and find out when they plan to be out. Okay. People are, are kind of answering. Okay. And um, I think that's pretty much it. Thanks, Jane. Kathy? Great. Um, just a couple quick things. Um, Vice Mayor Grooms and I had a wonderful opportunity to go to the Community and Champion Awards this Saturday. Um, I know a couple of my fellow um, council members also wanted to go. As you can hear, I have a cold. I think we all have a cold. This, is, this has been kind of a tough season. Um, but we had the opportunity to help recognize 199 champions, mostly students, but also some of the amazing staff. Um, and it was just, it was fantastic. And so I want to congratulate them again and thank you for, for letting us be part of that. Um, for those that aren't familiar with it, it's a wonderful opportunity where the business community, the schools come together um, and really pay um, I, I honor and recognize the young folks in the community that do so many service projects and they give away scholarships. And it, it really is a highlight. And so uh, thank you for, for letting us be part of that. Um, the second, um, I uh, reached out and shared a little bit earlier with, with Dana and Jennifer today that I'm getting um, more comments um, as the weather turns warm about the panhandling uh, continuing and actually picking up as we get into the spring. So I um, thought I would ask Jennifer if she could share a little bit about what we, you know, what the practices and the policies are. And then because it's an ongoing um, 
um, issue, some concerned about safety, some concerned about a variety of other things. Um, what additional things can we possibly do? And, and maybe that's bring it back for another discussion here at Council. But um, Jennifer, maybe you could share a little bit. And yeah, absolutely. So panhandling is a form of communication that's protected by the First Amendment. And we are limited in the regulations that we can adopt to kind of govern that. Um, we have, if there are safety issues, if there are certainly any other, uh, if we've got assault, disorderly conduct, they're trespassing independent charges, that's definitely something that the police can explore. Um, education has been our main tool with this and just educating the public. Please don't give money, instead direct towards resources where panhandlers can get help. And I know Sue has, has worked on a public education campaign on that and we have resource cards that we can give to those individuals to help them get linked up to help. Um, another thing that happened recently is City of Columbus has taken the view that they can't enforce any of their panhandling ordinances because of all of the federal case law that's come down recently. Uh, in March, they did have a public forum on panhandling, so they brought together uh, public health groups, resource groups, city council, it was a public services committee, um, police, and just everybody relaying their, their stories, the kind of specific problems that Columbus is facing so that then the city attorney's office can look and see if there's any way to craft very narrowly tailored laws or maybe do something else, another educational component that we could explore. That's certainly an option if you'd like to follow up with that. I saw something on next door uh, with respect. You could print the cards out that gave resources. Um, if we could pass more of those out than people are given cash, that might go a long way towards um, you know discouraging folks from from being here. I felt really bad for the people at Bridge and High. There was one uh, a panhandler there the other day that was uh, really Metso's patio and Mr. Sushi's patio, uh, looking right down. I mean, literally right there on a busy. Friday afternoon, Saturday afternoon, nice pleasant weather, and you know it's just distracting. So anyway, does that extend to parks other than just right of ways? Because isn't that that's technically our you know a park, uh, art and public places. Do we have any more movement in in a park setting than the, we do in a right of way? The most protected places are the traditional public forests, so sidewalks and right of way. There's a little more latitude with parks, and we have no solicitation generally. Uh, bands. But again, if they're just sitting there and they've got a sign, that's not even really speech. So we are limited, and there is a lot of federal case law on this, especially uh, since 2015 when the United States Supreme Court decided a case that impacts this. So, Dana? Yeah, we, we were anticipating more activity as the weather was changing. We relaunched our education component and in uh, uh, the cards that uh, Councilmember Keenan mentioned uh, are getting uh, circulated around and people are sharing those with each other and, and handing those out. Those were originally intended for the police department to hand out as they would interact with the various panhandlers and I guess you know the more people handing it to them is, is probably a good thing. And it also helps to educate the public about those kinds of resources that are available as much as it is about a card to hand to the panhandler because typically they know that answer and our public probably doesn't. So the other thing is we pushed out a News in 90 again that the chief had done. I thought he did a really good job in talking to the public about that. So we continue to emphasize those things and reach out as much as possible. We want to monitor the community dialogue that Columbus had. I think they had a good cross-section of their community and how they framed that. We could take a look at replicating that, but I would suggest first we, we take a look at, because they had a good cross-section of business and the various stakeholders, I, I think it would probably reflect the same dialogue, but I would like to benchmark off of them first, just initially see what they're doing. We could certainly have a, a town hall community dialogue about that as well be a great way to continue the communication and education effort on that. So, well, and, and everybody's frustration is the same yes. because the people that are, there is no, it is, we have a compassionate community and they want to help. However, the people that are in oftentimes don't want that help. And so they're not going to attend these forums and think, well, where do I go to get help? The resources are theirs. So all we can do is educate our community that 
it is not the compassionate thing to give them money in a handful of change out your door. Right. It, the compassion thing is to direct the people that really don't know where the resources are, where they can get them. And the people that are exploiting this situation aren't going to care what that card says. Um, so I can see how it's really frustrating. And it comes up, we've talked about this for years. <laughs> Um, and it's it's really it goes against people's gut instinct to be compassionate, especially when they have their pets out there with them and they're 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 portraying this image of being almost desperate. And you're thinking, oh my God, I'm so blessed, I can give a little. You're really making the situation worse when you do. So we really need, to, as a community, the only thing we can communicate to are the people who are the source because the receivers aren't going to be coming back again and again and again. They're going to get the resources and they're going to go use those mm -hmm. so it's frustrating we've we've gone around and around i know you had memos jen the last time that one of the cases come down maybe you could send that around to I, I we have one of the most compelling things that i heard was what was from one of our officers and this it was a matter of public record is you know there was someone who was panhandling on the corner and they went around to the back of the building and with the uh, proceeds of their panhandling they fed their opiate addiction and overdosed and I don't know how much of that story we can tell, um, but whatever extent we can tell that kind of story that is a matter of public record because the police were called and, you know, um, so, you know, it, it becomes a public record. But whatever we can do to, to help spread the message of, you know, there's resources that help and there's resources that hurt. And the cash that we give is oftentimes a hurtful resource and not a helpful one. Yeah, it's not really anecdotal. We, Chief, you, you've, you've, you've had medics out there. No, it's not there. anecdotal. Yeah. I just don't know how much of it. We uh, yeah, can, it'd be interesting to find out, Jennifer, whether you know whether there is a public uh, education kind of component that we can provide. You know, this is what's happening. We've made this many calls uh, to these locations, so. So. We are putting um, this panhandling issue on the Public Services Committee agenda. And Dana, I agree with you. I did a little bit of research about how other cities are doing this. And the focus group, the stakeholders group, of all the different resources that are available, they come with suggestions that each one of us can think of. And then we can communicate that. Because I particularly think that the children here in Dublin are the ones that are really asking the questions. I've had parents say to me, my child made me go back and give money they cried so badly because I passed them by. So education has to be in other places like the schools too. So yes, um, I think that's, we'll discuss that focus group, but I think that's yeah, I a think, great I idea. I think too there's oftentimes confusion between that and homelessness, and mm -hmm. I think that's an issue that is becoming more apparent uh, in the suburbs, and um, we've met with the community shelter board and have talked right. about can we be more of a lead suburb and the dialogue and, and raising awareness about that relative to, because they're not necessarily the same. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's confusion over that as well. So these are the kinds of things that we can't have in these community dialogues. And, and even and, those social <coughs> service agencies say, don't just give them a handful of coins. Oh, oh yeah, treatment. I got lectured I mean, that, very hard the, about that. The experts that say you can't, you can't <laughs> yeah. possibly do that. That's the worst thing you can do. I but think you're it's right yeah. when you're dealing with kids and they're crying and there's a dog and they, yeah. you know, it's all. I think it's really important that we send this message that yes, we want to stop panhandling on the streets because it's, it's mm -hmm. bothersome, but we also have to send the message that we're looking at ways as a community to help the other help side. The we them. absolutely want to do that. So by doing that, Cohesively, we can maybe find ways that we can lift that life a little bit. There is so, a safety concern too, really, because people slamming on the brakes all of yep. a sudden, the light turns green, someone takes off, someone slams on the brakes, and uh, there is a safety concern for stopping traffic. So, Dana, you'll you'll you guys will have conversations right. with the community yeah. service and bring something back to this group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, being able to share the information at the point of, of interaction, if you will. So I, I, I saw this last week. I saw a, a family pull over, roll down, and, and the, the young lady give money. So I, I saw this. Um, what can we do at, at these intersections or at these points to, to tell people that we have resources? Is there a way for us to communicate that at these very popular intersections so that people know that there are that there are resources that because we are a compassionate groups. So anyway, so you'll bring this back around. So we're going to come back. I just to verify. 
Thank you. We're going to come back to Community Services Committee of Council. The and public, the public Service Committee. Yeah, oh, we're okay. going to, we talked and um, Jane would like to put that on our agenda for next week. So okay. when I talk with Michelle tomorrow about the agenda and materials, we'll talk a little bit about that. And then we'll figure out how we want to have this discussion and good. bring those thoughts back to Council. Okay. Very good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. it. Is that it, Kathy? John? Yeah, I'd like to invite everybody to the city's um, latest uh, initiative, and that is redesigning the city flag. So how this will be conducted is that if you're feeling a little bit artistic and you want to show what you could do, the way that this will be conducted, to be fair, is that the design will be in one envelope, your name will be in a second envelope, and that will be in a third envelope. Uh, July the uh, 8th is the cutoff date. Uh, Nancy Richardson will be collecting these, I understand. And um, we're going to probably use the heraldic system to keep this thing a little bit organized so that we, so the patterns are interesting. So if you look back at our history, you know, there's the Irish, there's the Germans, there's corn, there's rivers, there's all kinds of interesting patterning you can come up with. So. Um, and what might become of this is absolutely nothing. We might look at the designs and say, we don't like any of these designs. There'll be three judges that have backgrounds in this kind of thing. And um, we might look at it and say, hey, we're going to keep our old flag, which may get retired with honors as a historical flag. Or uh, we might say, hey, these are really clever. Or I think, as Kathy suggested, maybe one of these experts will want to blend two of the designs together and everybody will get excited about it and say, you know, this really represents our city. And I think the... Um, the net net gain or the result of this is having a flag that we see all over flying off of standards, people taking them to sporting events, people hanging them from their house on the weekend, getting people excited. And so it's imperative that this flag sort of captures the uh, sort of simplistic and the elegance and the interest of our community all in one banner. So it's a pretty interesting challenge. So it's, it's totally anonymous. Nobody will know the winner. And I think that's very, very fair. So everybody's invited to participate. So it be and very interesting. How do they get the information so they know how to participate? It's going to be in the paper, and we're going to do a release and um, try to keep it um, open to everybody, actually, school kids. And there's, there's benefits to this, too, because if the school kids are st they're Googling flags or heraldry, and they'll see five pages of ideas. And um, so it would be sort of fun for them to get involved. So we don't know what the result's going to be. You may not like any of the choices. And we'll go back to old Betsy here. Or we <laughs> you might come up with something new and innovative that we think is really cool. Is that it? That's it. Thank you, John. Mike? Uh, I just want to point out in the, in the presentation that we talked about the uh, Verizon building going to the schools. That's not all tax abated. If it, isn't some of that rented? Oh, I'm sorry. No, that entire building will be exempt. But it's rented now, right? Some of those floors are rented? Why did I think that? The building next door is has uh, remained in private sector. But there's, so the school has the entire, I thought they were divvying some space up. So. They can't okay. put students on the top floor. Yeah, they're going to put administration. Or they're administration uh, okay. on the top. All right, so fair enough. Um, also, I, I took a video, of, not that it's germane, but I saw the, um, the street sweeper. Uh, going back and forth uh, like last week or whatever, and it was throwing more dust than it was picking anything up. It looked like a dust cloud, like Linus with the, and you know, uh, and I thought that they throw water down to cut that. If you want to see the video, I've got it. Yeah, uh, just to not being critical, I just thought it was kind of interesting. And Matt, I want to thank you for your help on the uh, the wood lots with the war zone where all the trees have been knocked down. I know you're going to do the best you can to trying to alleviate some of those neighbors' concerns um, this summer when it dries out. Thanks, Mike. Christina? Um, how, how did the household hazardous waste collection go this year? Hmm? Did it go better? Yeah? It was good footage. So Megan said yes, it went very well. I drove by there a couple times, and there were pretty good lines, but I don't, I don't know exactly how. Okay, yeah. It, it'll be quite a while, as you know, before we get the numbers. But. Yeah, I just, I know that there were some concerns about wait times and things like that last year, so I was just curious how. Well, they doubled up on the lanes this year, right, which really helped out a lot. <laughs> so that worked well. Awesome, thank you. That, that's really all I had. Thanks, Christina. Chris? Uh, did have the pleasure of swearing in our two newest CSEC members on the 10th, and they were very excited and raring to go. 
Um, the Convention and Visitors Board meeting this month uh, was joined by some of you at Muirfield Village. We got a great insight as looking forward to the tournament this year and the excitement was and there was allusion to what golfers might be coming uh, who, are, who have not been here in several years who may be returning this year for the Memorial Tournament. So there'll be a lot of excitement about that particular golfer that may return. Um, whoever could you be talking? Whoever that could be. Um, went, attended the East Dublin Civic Association meeting on the 11th. Uh, Christina was there as well. Um, thank you, Matt, for the follow-up for Thaddeus Kazusko uh, Park. I, I did drive by there uh, the next couple of days and they, they had a hydraulic rake and they were raking the debris uh, up and it looked like they were prepping it for uh, whatever step is next and maybe some plantings and things that you referred to. So thank you for that memo. Um, I know you're going to talk about Mr. Hidaka and the cherry blossom lunch and then the last thing I wanted to say was I was able to give the welcome at the um, spring neighborhood meeting and wanted to just publicly thank all of the folks that serve on our neighborhood um, board of directors and the great things that they do for the city and it is a um, it is a labor of love and a thankless job so thank I uh, just want to thank them for attending and thank staff for putting together that program That's all I have oh 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 well that is not all I have because before we're together next we have two members of our council here that will be a year older so in, in inside a month we will gain two years of wisdom so uh, Mayor Peterson, so we could use uh, happy birthday from your fellow you. members of council and Jane Fox as well. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> yeah, me too. Justin, so we're having another take back to only in Dublin do we do a take back Tuesday on a Saturday morning. <laughs> do you, what are the, where are we going to be? Is it 10 to 2 and where is it we're going to be? Do you know off the top of your head, Nancy? At the Justice Center? Okay, so we're doing another one of the... Uh, prescription drug take back efforts. The last ones we've done have been terrifically successful. Um, Make sure so. we tell that person that wrote the hilarious letter to the editor about Christmas and St. Patrick's Day celebrations. Yeah, well, we, so we, we finally got the calendar straight. On Saturday. Yeah, so we did the St. Patrick's Day a week before St. Patrick's Day, and we're that doing Take Back Tuesday on a Saturday. So <laughs> that's good. Um, so that's this weekend, 10 to 2. Is it just? Okay, so great. So we encourage people to come out and, and continue with that worthy cause and the last thing I oh, but thanks to Angel for all of the effort you put into the I know that that is it's the same presentation but it is totally new numbers every time you do it so it takes a tremendous amount of work so thank you for doing that and the Hadakas I know I think this is the last first time we've been together since being at the Hadaka luncheon and it was once again a stellar um, production of the Hadakas and, and their welcoming of of us the city and the relationship with them and our community is something that we treasure and when you, you look down that list when the library when Pat was going through the list of uh, contributors and people to help raise money Mr. Hadak his name is on there um, so he's he's yeah and it is um, they're just a fantastic couple and it's a fantastic company and we really appreciate their relationship with our city so with that we are adjourned I hope my phone <laughs>